Joshua. Just to introduce myself, I'm David Cox. I'm the director of the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab, and we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, and we're going to uh, have a brief fireside chat. Apologies that there's no fire here. Uh, I was actually told that technologically it was possible, but we thought that that would be tacky. Um, so, Joshua, I just want to start off uh, uh, with, a, with a, you know, before we dive into the technical discussion, um, the fascinating talk. Um, since uh, it's been a while since I've seen you, and since then you won the the Turing Award, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to congratulate you publicly. It's a tremendously well-deserved honor. So, uh, highlight that. So, uh, and also just as a, a bit of a plug for some of the other activities that are happening at AI Research Week, uh, we're running a workshop on causality and transfer learning, uh, which uh, is consonant with many of the ideas. We'll share some of our work, but also the work from the community in the Boston area. We also have a workshop on neurosymbolic reasoning and machine common sense, uh, which I, I think is also in a lot of the similar themes. But I just wanted to unpack uh, two, two things, and, and one of them starts with that, that word, the S word. Yes. Uh, so you didn't say the word symbols, uh, ah. <laughs> uh, and, and yet, uh, in many ways, symbols embody a lot of the ideas you have. So they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> so, so so they're they're compact, uh, you know, right, low right. Uh, you know yeah. low dimensional. Right. Uh, what what are your thoughts? So you know, in deep learning, we don't do symbols; we do distributed representations of concepts. Uh, so. What I, I personally want to take out of the, the classical AI work with reasoning and logic and so on actually is not the symbols. I mean, th there's discrete concepts, for sure, uh, but it's much more profitable from a generalization perspective to think of these discrete concepts as um, uh, you know, having attributes that make cats and dogs close to each other so you can generalize across them. But the, the, the thing, so that's like an old idea from Jeff Hinton, right, in the early 80s. But um, the new thing is with the attention mechanisms I've been talking about. What the attention mechanisms, I think, can bring to deep learning uh, that is also inspired from classical AI is the ability to manipulate variables. The ability to do computation on objects uh, and not always the same objects. Um, just like in programming, we have functions and we can call those functions with different arguments depending on the context. Whereas in a normal neural net, it's always the same neurons uh, sending their outputs to the same other neurons. But we, when you put in an intention mechanism, it's like you're saying, oh, I can choose which neurons are gonna send their outputs to this guy, right? And, and now you have to start thinking in ways that look more like classical programming or classical AI where in addition to values being sent, you have to tell the guy which receives, uh, who's that guy who's sending? Like, what is my name, right? What, a, what and, and names now is not, not gonna be a symbol, it's gonna be a, 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 a vector, which is like a key. In, in, in transformer networks and attention mechanisms, you have key and queries. So the key becomes like a type or a name uh, that allows the uh, recipient uh, NLP to know you know, what is this variable that it's getting? Not just its value, but uh, who's that, right? Uh, what is that variable? And, uh, and now you can do things, of course, with recurrence to uh, recurse and do these things. So I think a lot of concepts that have been developed in classical AI, including like chains of reasoning and so on, can be transported to the neural net world. But, but in that way, transforming that, uh, the way we think about neural nets from these vector processing machines to uh, systems that can handle variables, recursion, and, and all these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've been investing heavily in what we're calling neurosymbolic, and other people are calling neurosymbolic systems. And we're actually agnostic on what we mean by that. Uh, it's always good to have a little bit of uh, vagary if you're not sure yet what you wanna brand something as. But uh, there's a version of it where we say, okay, how can we teach neural networks to process things that are symbol-like, yeah. uh, like what you're describing? But there's another view which says, well, if we have symbolic systems uh, and we can get from neural networks yeah. to get from the world to those symbolic systems, uh, that's, you know, not, so, gonna, that's so, not gonna work. You don't think that's okay? So, so, so David Cicillo has an interesting, interesting quote, which is, uh, you know, uh, reasoning, human reasoning and logic is uh, crappy Turing machines running on amazing neural networks. 
and uh, neural networks today are crappy neural networks running on amazing Turing machines. <laughs> uh, so, you know, if we actually combine the two, and again, we're, we're agnostic on this, we're, we're yeah, doing yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. of both. Uh, yeah, nobody knows, I mean, we're exploring. But, exactly, so, but, so, so but my what are your feeling, thoughts on that? My feeling is that just like sticking classical AI on top of neural nets is not sufficient. So, um, one, you wanna keep this um, uh, soft probabilistic distributed attributes and, and not suddenly move to the uh, pure discrete logic thing, mm -hmm. um, to, at least to mimic the kind of reasoning that humans do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can do amazing things with uh, classical programming and optimization and search. But, but I mean, if your goal is to emulate the sort of uh, uh, reasoning and high level cognition that humans do, I think you have to build in the system one part, like the deep learning part, uh, inside of the reasoning, right? So it can't be totally uh, separated. For example, the control mechanism which decides where to search, because when you do reasoning, it's basically like the search, right? Uh, and right now, our uh, reasoning systems, they are like super expensive in terms of search. Like they, they look at zillions of things. Monte Carlo tree search mm -hmm. uh, is probably the best integration we have right now. And uh, Human reasoning is very, very different. We just look at two or three things. Wow, this sounds like magic, right? And it's because we have a, 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 a controller that decides what to focus our attention on, our thoughts on, and, and, and it, it's very, very efficient, but it, it, it can only do it because it's grounded in sort of all of that intuitive background context that the system one provides. Sure, and then increasingly there are uh, formal reasoning systems that rely on a neural network to do premise selection, for instance, to reduce search spaces and things like that. So lots of uh, confluence of, of different ideas. Probabilistic programming uh, you know, is, is another sort of right. uh, intermediate uh, area where you can actually have program, you, know, you, you invoked arguments, and uh, as you imagine, increasingly sophisticated systems, you know, probabilistic program gives you the ability to represent things that are, are not fixed and discrete and don't have those that brittleness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how, how do you feel about? Um, I think it's an interesting direction, but again, there are many ways you could do it, and, and I would favor the ways which uh, uh, don't lose the, these distributed representations, mm. right? Uh, yeah. if, you, uh, if you do it purely in the, in the symbolic realm, even probabilistic, it's not sufficient, I think. Mm -hmm. So another, just to dig into another area which you invoked a lot is, is biology. So and Dario right. laid out this idea that there's a, you know, this sort of intrinsic motivation of deep learning originally came from, from, from biology, but it's a fairly loose inspiration. I, I know this is an area you work in, we've talked about it before. Um, how important do you think biology is? Where, how, how does that flow? I mean, the work you do in biologically plausible uh, backprop backpropagation, yeah. Is that uh, meant as a service to neuroscience, or are you looking for, uh, you know, is that scientific discovery, or do you think there's, there's real kind of gold there in inspiring us for new approaches? So, in a good fraction of the talks, my first slide is uh, about this hypothesis that there might be a few simple principles uh, which explain biological intelligence and that we could use to build intelligent machines. If you believe this hypothesis, which is a hypothesis, of course, uh, then the kind of work that tries to build things that are both compatible with our uh, scientific understanding of what works in AI and machine learning and what seems to happen with biology should bear fruits on both sides. Hmm. Um, and I would say these days I'm more interested in um, uh, talking to people who work with uh, child development or high level cognition because I, I you know I'm thinking about these things about causality and and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, reasoning and so on um, but but I think in general we should look at um, potentially all sources of information about human intelligence including even the social aspects right people are starting to look at that uh, in order to serve as inspiration for our machine learning approaches Hmm. Yeah, and the connection to, to cognitive uh, developmental psychologists is interesting. We're now participating together with MIT in a DARPA program on machine common sense, and actually a mandate of the program is that we actually include developmental psychologists as members of our team, and right, they're actually right. running violation of expectation tests on agent-based systems yeah, yeah. That, that we've been asked to build. Um, so, so one of the areas of neuroscience where I'd like to see more work done that would really be helpful for the program I've been talking about is uh, 
regarding memory mm -hmm. and, and attention. Because uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, memory that we've put in neural nets these days, I mean like the extended memory neural nets like uh, neural train machines and, 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 and all this, um, they're not the kind of memory that you find in, in human brains. It doesn't look very plausible. Um, so it looks like a lot of our memory um, and uh, the way that we select, like attention is, is more of a process of the dynam coming from the dynamics of, of the circuit, which uh, leads to sort of concentration of activity in a few selected places rather than copying information in some memory bank and then retrieving it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, another area um, of intersection with biology, of course, is um, you, you mentioned sample efficiency and, and you know, natural selection is probably, has, a, has a sample efficiency problem insofar as your samples are babies and uh, you only have a few of them and they're expensive to make <laughs> and, uh, and they, you know, choosing the wrong sample means they die. So right. um, it, it, do you think there are tie But evolution there? doesn't care if we die because you have billions of humans, right? True, true, true. Um, but we care. We, we, we care, we care. <laughs> uh, and, and the process as a whole also needs to be efficient. And so, so in, in many ways, you know, evolution is yes. another layer of, of learning yes. on top. So actually the, the, the work on meta-learning uh, started in the early 90s. And uh, with my brother Sammy, we worked, it was actually his thesis topic. Uh, we worked on you know, inner optimization, inner learning, outer learning, where the outer learning was meant to be like evolution, but because we didn't have supercomputers, we said, oh, let's backprop into the outer learning. Um, and so that was the initial inspiration. Nowadays, people are thinking about meta-learning potentially as something that may happen within the lifetime, within a, a, you know, one brain. You could have learning to learn going on. Uh, because we are uh, exposed to changes in distribution, as I was talking about in my presentation. Yeah, and, and changes in distribution, uh, arguably one of the, natural selection is an example of yeah. non-stationary distributions yeah. and trying to adapt the architecture. And of course, there are connections to neural architecture search and, yes. and methods like, like that. Except that traditionally, people have been using meta-learning and, and uh, architecture search to optimize for IID generalization. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing that says you can't use the same mechanism for optimizing for transfer learning, for you know, what happens when I use my learning in a new environment. Hmm. Very good. I, I just wanted to end with a, a bit of a sociology question. So the first time I heard you speak uh, was at a workshop at Snowbird. Uh, and I think there were... That's the pre-iClear conference. Yeah, yeah. So, I, and I think there were probably a, a couple hundred people there yes. at most. Uh, and, uh, the, good, at good old times. The, the, the good old times. Uh, and now we live in a world where NeurIPS, uh, you know, now we're, we're doing a lottery this year. Last year it sold out in 12 minutes. I was in a cab coming from the Sao Paulo airport desperately trying to register during those 12 minutes. And I didn't quite, yeah, yeah. Didn't quite make it. Uh, but eventually got a ticket, thankfully. But... Uh, how has that changed? I mean, as, as a field explodes, you know, yeah. the, the mean time somebody has spent in that field suddenly, you know, dramatically decreases. And you get all these right. people who are new to the field and are, are, you know, their history starts, you know, post 2000. Right, right. How has that changed? Is that all positive? No. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> but uh, it, it has a lot of positive. I mean, progress has accelerated for sure because of the sheer number of people doing research in this field. Uh, at the same time, of course, the, they don't read the old papers from the 90s, and uh, that's just deep learning or neural net papers, but they don't read other papers, and like, they don't even know what an expert system is or uh, search. Like, they, they just even not learn it in school. Like, it's just uh, very strange. Um, and there are some negative effects also in the culture it feels like everyone is, is, is in this crazy race for the next first author paper mm. um, instead of thinking about the longer term picture. So when things were slow and there were just a few hundred people working on this, um, you could dream of problems that might take years to solve and quietly you know, hack at these things. But now uh, grad students are afraid of someone else in another lab doing the same thing and so they're, they're rushing like crazy. So I don't know, there's something that needs to be fixed. I don't know if we can fix, but the culture is too much focused on short-term incremental progress rather than attacking really, really hard problems that might take a decade to address. So how do we give 
the next generation in that space? How do we? So I think we should move from the conference uh, publication uh, centered mechanisms to more journal-like things where there is no deadline. Um, you submit your thing when you feel it's ready. And, uh, and that gives less of a pressure to submit, 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 you know, um, uh, because it's a deadline. I have to submit something. Right? Yeah, Otherwise, I'm, I'm not a good human being. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so we need to reassign self-worth. Yes, is, is, yes. Is what you're and, saying. And, 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 and also, I think it's important for community service. I mean, it used to be that doing things for the community was uh, highly valued. And now, because there's so much pressure to publish, um, we're losing some of that. And it's very, very dangerous. OK, and, w and one last question. So I've seen you give uh, talks before where you end a few slides later. Yes. Uh, and you talk about social good. That's right. And the importance of. And that's exactly connected to this. Uh, if we want people to start understanding the impact of their work in the broader society, they need to step back a little bit from the next deadline and start talking to philosophers, start talking to legal experts, start talking to uh, medical people, and, and, uh, and learn about the the ethics of what they're doing. Um, so I think it's very, very important because it, the progress in AI is leading very, very powerful tools. And these tools could be misused. And they will be misused. And so we really need to pay attention to this. OK. And two minutes, 40 seconds on the clock. Uh, we have many students in the audience today. Uh, what's your advice to them? Um, don't fall prey to this sort of pressure to publish short term. Uh, work on hard problems. Uh, be ambitious. And uh, ambitious doesn't mean more papers. It means hard problems. Uh, don't go for what's popular. Don't do the things that I say you should do, but like think by yourself. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, on that note, thank you, Yasha.